Hi, you're listening to Conversations with Musicians with Leia Roseman. Shirley Kazuo Muramoto is a California-based Koto performer and teacher, and she also created Hidden Legacy, the story of the Japanese traditional performing arts in the American World War II internment camps. In this episode, she performs some incredibly beautiful Koto music, and there are wonderful stories with each composition. Like all my episodes, this is available as both video and podcast, and for those of you watching the video, you'll notice that Shirley generously re-recorded one of her performances of a very special piece. If you want to jump straight to some music or different topics in our conversation, you can use the timestamps. However, I encourage you to listen to the whole episode with Shirley's engaging insights about family and identity. You can also read the transcript. Everything is linked in the description to my website, leiaroseman.com, where you can sign up for my newsletter and get exclusive sneak peeks for upcoming episodes. Hi, Shirley. Thanks so much for being here today. Oh, thank you, Leah, for inviting me to be here. (laughs) Now, you're sitting there with your koto, and... Mm -hmm. Not everybody listening to this can see. Some people are listening to the podcast. So if you could just describe Mm -hmm. briefly the instrument and play a little bit for us before we get into our conversation, that would be wonderful. Oh, all right. Um, Well, the koto is a um, national instrument of Japan. It uh, came from China in about the 8th century. uh, And then it um, uh, went through Korea and Okinawa and went through different changes, but basically um, the traditional koto that we play in Japan these days um, is has has remained unchanged. So it's pretty much the way it, it, it's been for all those centuries. It's um, it has uh, thirteen strings, and I don't know if you can see it, but you know it's kind of like this, and um, it resembles a dragon. Right, the dragon is a very auspicious um, creature in Asian culture, right? So it's looked upon as uh, something a good luck thing. So, so even the parts of the koto are named after dragon parts. Like you know, the part over here is the head. The inside um, section is, they call the dragon's tongue. Uh, this back section is the spine of the of the dragon, right? It kind of looks like it with these tuning bridges. And um, the very end is the tail, right? Mm. Yeah. It's hollow, um, right? You know, uh, you want to see there's sound holes here. There's one on the top and then one at the end. So it, it's pretty resonant, right? Yeah, And of course, you know, just like, you, you know, the harp um, strings resonate. So... Right, it's, it has this kind of uh, quality that just keeps on ringing, you know. And um, strings are these strings um, originally were made of silk, right? And um, but since silk is nowadays, it's a little bit uh, uh, difficult to to have silk strings on for any p- long period of time. They've made um, a nylon version called tichong, mm. and these uh, these last longer. Um, for more modern pieces now that are um, require the strings to be strung tighter, um, these are much better for holding up to that. So um, I think that's generally about the koto instrument itself. Um, um, I use three finger picks mm-hmm. here on my right hand, and um, and even these fingers sometimes without picks. And then I also use my left hand without picks, so you get a different textures, you know, if I use either hand, I can bend notes, right, or, right, you know, um, let's see, uh, that's by pressing on the other side of the bridges, Mm -hmm. the bridges um, are tunable by moving them back and forth, right, so, and um, because of the finger picks, I can get a um, a myriad of different tonalities. Um, I can swish them right, on the strings because the strings are actually wound. It's not just like a one piece. So you, I, I kind of, I do a, a, a rap thing, you know, kind of thing because you can, um, you can slip your finger, finger, um, picks underneath the strings 
right? Um, and do a lot of different techniques, scraping, scraping, right? That kind of scraping technique. Um, we generally don't play the other side of the koto, we turn the right side of the koto, mm -hmm. but nowadays there's many other uses for the also the other side of the koto. Uh, yeah, so that's a little brief overview of things that you, um, you can play on the koto, right? Wonderful. Yeah. So, so yeah, if we could start with some music and then we can get into some interesting conversation and come back to music later, that would be great. Okay. Can can we take a a, a moment then? Because I'm going to put this, of this thing on my on my, um, on my picks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I wanted to play something kind of um, a little bit active. Mm -hmm. And if you don't put something kind of sticky on your fingers, it'll fall off. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. My my mom was a teacher, and um, so she the traditional thing is to use egg, egg whites. Okay. Right. And then I thought after a while, the egg whites get a little icky. So um, I'm using, actually, I'm using eyelash, fake eyelash glue. <laughs> Tricks of the trade. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, people use different things now. Um, you know, the, the Chinese version of this is called the gujong, mm -hmm. right? Um, they tape their finger picks on. They also use finger picks. Mm -hmm. and, um, and they tape it on with... Um, some it's it's like an adhesive, I, you know what do you call it? Um, no, it's like a what is surgical tape or something okay. like that, right? You know, tape it onto their fingers every time. Mm -hmm. So, um, right, yeah. There's various types of zithers in Asia that are pretty similar to each other. The Chinese version has steel strings, usually more strings, like twenty something strings. Mm -hmm. The Korean is kayagum. The Vietnamese is danchan. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the Korean version, they don't use any finger picks. It's all, you know, your bare fingers, mm -hmm. right? Um, yeah, the koto actually has um, other versions as well. They have a bass koto that's 17 strings. Um, nowadays, uh, the more modern version of koto has 20 some odd strings. <laughs> so, um, and at one time, uh, the famous uh, blind composer Michio Miyagi made a 88 string koto to try wow. to mimic the piano All right <laughs> yeah it wasn't played too often <laughs> but um yeah so okay so I thought I'd play a version of um Sakura which is the most traditional song from um Japan it means cherry blossoms right and so there you'll hear many versions of Sakura if you go to Japan um uh, and uh, this version is by Kimio Eto. He was also a blind musician, right? And um, um, I'm sure a lot of people don't remember him, but he, he came over here in the late 50s. And um, before that, he, he would uh, perform with American GIs after, the, after World War II. So he started getting some Western influence in his music, right? And, um, and he even somehow met some pretty... Um, uh, auspicious um, uh, musicians like Harry Belafonte. He was on his, one of his albums. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there was a composer named uh, Henry Cowell. He's a California composer that liked to um, incorporate um, ethnic instruments in his compositions. So he, he struck up a um, friendship with him, right, for a bit. And Henry Cowell wrote a, a piece called... Uh, um, for, something for a koto and orchestra, the first okay. con concerto or something. And uh, Kimio Eto had to learn his his part in Braille because he's blind, right? Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. So he was on um, a couple variety shows back in the day, uh, the Danny Kay show, which maybe people don't remember. <laughs> I don't know Danny Kay, but he was an mm -hmm. um, entertainer during yeah. that time. And, um, and I, I met him on, yeah, I actually met him when I was about nine years old mm -hmm. and, um, I, I tagged along on a lesson that my mom was having with him in San Jose, California, when he came to perform. And I was just really influenced by, 
by his playing and his compositions. I told my mom I wanted to take a lesson too, and she said, "You're too young." So, <laughs> so um, I I just kind of went on this lifelong um, uh, journey to try to find him in Japan. After I think about. You know, in the early 70s, he went back to Japan and never came back Hmm. to the United States. So um, I loved his music so much that every time I went to Japan, I tried to get anything that was written by him. Mm -hmm. And um, um, this piece that I'm going to play is one of the pieces on on, um, something like maybe three or four albums that he did in the United States. Mm -hmm. What I didn't realize, you know, they've come out with some printed... um, books of his compositions now it seems like that was um something that was not really you know worked on as much right but um but now people are starting to realize and notice him more okay that he's passed away <laughs> right mm-hmm. right so so um this is a version of sakura i've been looking for most of my life i mean i loved it so much i actually transcribed it from um from one of his records so so when I saw the printed version, it's a little bit different mm-hmm. um, from the recording. And after I, you know, I was researching whatever he played, um, I noticed that every time he played he, even his own compositions, he changed them up a little bit. Mm-hmm. So, um, so um, I told his son that I wanted to record it the way I heard it on his L- LP. And so that's, this is the way I've um, learned it and I perform it these days. Okay. Okay.
Wow. So beautiful. Thank you, Shirley. Oh, thank you. I was just thinking that that uh, arrangement has so much interest and so much texture, Mm -hmm. and it must have been so much work and really a work of love and dedication to do that transcription. Oh, yeah, it was. I mean, I... I, every time I went to Japan, I looked for him, right? <laughs> and he was he was kind of a maybe he was kind of an eccentric person. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, what I heard about later on was, um, you know, because he did these maybe outside of the box things for the tradition, tradition mm-hmm. that he was he might have been uh, kicked out of the school, right? And uh, <laughs> so that's why he made his own school. Uh, in Japan, mm-hmm. um, yeah, he got into some trouble, I think, uh, when he was in, in the States, which which is why he, could, he couldn't he could come back, I think. Okay. I don't know the, all the details, but, uh, but he was, um, he was a genius, um, composer, um, performer, my, my <laughs> you know, um, a lot of these techniques are not traditional koto techniques, mm-hmm. right? And um, even my mother would say, well, you know, he's blind, so he can do all those things, right? But I said, that's, that's no excuse, right? We should be able to also, you know, work hard enough to be able to play, you know, these techniques. So mm-hmm. um, it, it, it took a, a long time to figure out. <laughs> even the tuning is a little bit um, kind of a hybrid tuning. Okay. This is not the traditional. Um, it's part of the traditional scale, but he changed it up, you know, and um, so he's able to do some different things with the composition, right? Okay. Yeah. So um, a lot of his works are just um, incredibly uh, uh, beautiful and difficult. (laughs) (laughs) Excuse me. Yeah. Well, I had discovered you through actually Destiny Muhammad, the uh, jazz harpist, because Mm -hmm. she's a guest and her episode will be released before yours. So people Mm -hmm. hopefully will have heard that episode. Mm -hmm. And then I saw it was a jazz koto. So I was completely fascinated. (laughs) And I had it in my mind to definitely find a koto player. So I was delighted when you agreed to, to come and do this today. Mm -hmm. You got into playing in different styles. Was that early on or with your son, Brian? How did that happen for you? You know, I I grew up playing the koto because my mother's a koto Mm -hmm. teacher. And, um, I think um, the way koto is is taught, you you basically learn a certain style or you know whatever school you're with. Mm-hmm. Um, that school usually nowadays is um, um, has works by a main composer, right? And the main composer of my mother's koto school was um, Chikushi Katsuko, who is a for a long time the only woman composer on the koto. Right? Okay, <laughs> right. And, um, so, um, when I grew up with it, I, I learned, of course, the traditions, which is, uh, basically you, you only play the music of your school, you know, you don't play music from other people's schools and, um, and it's, it's even frowned upon to, um, 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 perform with them or, you know, do things together with people from other schools, Right. So it's the tradition is, you know, pretty, it used to be very uh, strict Mm -hmm. and, um, you know, it didn't really encourage creativity, right? You know, if you wanted to compose your own music, then um, if it's going to be a lot of music, they would tell you to form your own school, right? (laughs) That kind of thing teachers weren't really encouraged to do anything outside of the box per se. Mm-hmm. Right. You know, and, um, you know, I'm, I'm a fourth generation American and I was growing up playing all this Japanese music and thinking like, wow, this is, I wish I could do something else <laughs> with it. Mm-hmm. Right. And, um, and even, and, um, even from my, my Koto school, um, new music was coming out. Right. Um, the, son of the headmaster, uh, it was a guitarist. His name was Ichiro, uh-huh. uh, Ichiro Sakamoto. And um, he started writing music for the koto. 
pretty much based on his guitar, right? Mm-hmm. His guitar techniques, um, his you know understanding of Western music, and uh, we started getting pieces like tangos, um, you know, uh, Persian market, the third man theme, you know, things like this. And so um, I thought, wow, this is really cool, and I'm going to start my own p- band, right, with this music. Mm-hmm. So in high school, I started to kind of uh, gravitate toward trying something different with with the music we were getting from from him, mm-hmm. right? And um, you know, I'm growing up in Oakland, California. Um, I'm exposed to you know, actually mostly rhythm and blues and soul, but you know, rock and you know all these other um, you know types of music. And and I thought there's there's got to be a way I can play that music on the koto, right? So it's it's pretty much been a long journey trying to figure this out, <laughs> right? Because um, I didn't want to change the koto too much. Mm-hmm. I wanted to keep, you know, being able to play the techniques and and um, and work around, um, you know, playing playing in these genres without changing my tuning so much because I realized that um, if I, I, I can change my tuning to Western scales and I, you know, we do that sometimes, Mm -hmm. but um, you know, to me, the soul of the Koto comes from the the Asian uh, tunings that we use. Mm -hmm. Right. It's, it brings out the best tone, um, you know, because, you know, they, uh, the strings resonate. I feel like they resonate, you know, Harmon, uh, harmonically, harmon- harmoniously, right, mm-hmm. in in the Asian uh, pentatonic scales. So, so my goal was to try to stay, in, uh, you know, with those scales while I was playing, you know, different genres of music. Mm-hmm. So that was um, that was a, a skill that I've developed through the years. But you know, at first it was. I had no clue, and everybody told me, okay, if you want to learn how to improvise in jazz or whatever, just listen to a lot of jazz, right? And, you know, and that's that's it. You have to listen to a lot of jazz, listen, listen to a lot of different music and musicians to get, you know, start to get this, you know, feel for it and how you want to want it to come out from you mm-hmm. instead of, you know, copying people too much, right? So... And I really couldn't copy too many people because <laughs> because I only have thirteen strings. I don't have all the notes. Um, if I tuned it to a Western, you know, um, scale, and I just played, you know, basically on the, those scales, I felt like I sounded too much like a you know a harp or a guitar. Mm-hmm. And so whenever anybody asked me to be to collaborate with them. And I, I wouldn't need more notes or something like this. I would just tell them, why don't you get a harpist or a guitarist? Because, you know, you're not going to, you know, you, you know they have more um, no, more notes than I'm, go- I'm going to have. Yeah. Right. So, um, you know, I, I didn't want to get into any projects where I didn't feel like you couldn't hear the um, personality of the koto. Yeah. I was just trying to remember if it was Alice Coltrane or Dorothy Ashby that had some Koto on yeah, their album. Yeah, Dorothy Ashby. It was right. Dorothy, okay. Oh, actually, um, both of them. Yeah, I think um, Destiny brought that out, right? And, yeah. Uh, we, we, mm-hmm. And we even did one of um, uh, Dorothy, um, Dorothy Ashby's Moving Finger. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I even asked um, Destiny if we could do a video, and, and that's on YouTube now. So, yeah, I saw that. Oh, you saw it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right so um so she she experimented on the koto as well i, I didn't i hadn't heard anything about that until destiny told me about that mm-hmm. and um you know it's because i've i've become more used to my trying to adapt to whatever the project is right you know when i heard that that piece the moving finger i could hear a pentatonic scale so i thought okay you know we can do this together Right. So for your Game of Thrones um, <laughs> arrangement, for example, mm-hmm. was that a request or are you a Game of Thrones fan? Had you heard the music? Uh, I'm not a Game of Thrones <laughs> fan. I had never seen it before. Um, a, a lot of the arrangements that I do are, you know, it's something that come 
kind of comes to me because, um, you know, Game of Thrones came to me because my students were watching it. Mm-hmm. And my students were going, oh, you have to see this Game of Thrones, right? And um, I had I didn't have Netflix, so I couldn't watch it. Everybody kept talking about it. So um, sometimes I make arrangements so that they can, um, you know, they can have more fun with the music. Uh, I thought, okay, I'll make an arrangement of Game of Thrones. And, right, it, that's that's what came came out of that video, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, um, yeah, so, you know, I have students that are multicultural these days, right? Um, I had a student who was half Guatemalan and half uh, African-American. And, and so I asked their Guatemalan mother, do you have any Guatemalan songs that you might, you know, like your daughters to learn? There, there were sisters that were learning, learning from mm-hmm. me. And so she gave me a few songs that I could listen to, and I chose one that I thought would work for the koto. Mm-hmm. And I asked her if she could teach them the the song, right? And she just went to town with it. She made her daughters sing that song every night before they went to bed. Mm-hmm. <laughs> they learned the words. I, I'm pretty sure they they will never forget it, right? You know, and um, and so when we played it, um, you know. They they sang the song as as we played it on the koto, so, uh, and I re- I wish I could remember what the title is, but I can't right now. <laughs> mm-hmm. Hi, just a quick break from the episode. I'm an independent podcaster who does all the many jobs required to produce the series, and there are a lot of costs I bear as well. Please consider either buying me a virtual coffee as a tip or becoming a monthly supporter starting at $3 Canadian, which is close to $2 US or 2 euros, and getting access to unique perks. The link is in the description. Now back to the episode. So this piece is um, my mom's favorite piece. It's called Maboroshi o Ote. That means memories, right? So um, it's a... uh, it's a shorter piece, you know, and um, it's it's very nice. Um, has a more to me, it has a Latin flavor to it, right? And um, you know, it's very expressive. Um, it it was interesting to me that you know she taught it to me in a certain way, and recently I think the, um, the school is changing the style of it, but um, but I like the way she taught it to me, and so I'm I kind of play it like that. <laughs> okay, so this is uh, Maburoshi o Te.
Thank you so much for that. Oh, thank you. <laughs> your your middle name, Kazuo, is your Koto name? That's my Koto name. So who gave that to you? Uh, of course, you know, my parents gave me that name. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, music names in Japan are based on your headmaster, right? The headmaster of my school is uh, Katsuko, right? So you take part of their name. Uh, Katsuko, I can't remember all the the um, kanji, which is the Chinese characters. Mm -hmm. But the first character is uh, uta, which is song. Okay. Okay. So uh, my mother's professional name is Kazu, Kazuko, right? And uh, when she attained her um, professional name, her father told her, maybe you should have the name Kashu, right? Which was, you know, the first ka uta, song and the second um character represented state right and in the old days they used to call california kashu with okay. you know, different different character but the pronunciation was kashu so she he said yeah i think your name should be <coughs> your name should be ka kashu, kashu right sorry and then um uh when she came to the United States, at that time they were in Japan. Mm -hmm. She she came to the United States uh, uh, when she was eighteen. This is kind of after the war. She was born in Palo Alto, but went to camp. They went to Japan after the camp, and then came back here. And um, you know, she married my dad. And um, um, when she went playing koto for different functions and events. Um, the name Kashu sounded more masculine than feminine. Mm -hmm. So she decided to add the character Ko, 
right? A lot of women's names are, you know, Keiko or Hanako or something like that. They end in the character Ko, which actually means child. I don't okay. know. <laughs> so, um, so that what made her name Kazuru Kazu Ko, mm -hmm. right? And um, when she got married, um, they they also count the number of strokes in the characters. And they said that um, when they put the ko on her name, the number of strokes became more uh, fortunate, right? Right. So it was a better thing for her. And, you know, and she, she, she and I are both spiritual <laughs> people. And she believes that when she changed her name to, you know, added the ko to Kazuko, that her studio um, started getting bigger and she had more students and things like this, right? So, so my name is part of her name, right? Kazu, it's the same thing. Uh, song, state, and then yo means that you're going to carry on. You're, you know, a branch of. Okay. Right. What? Right. So that's that's why um, my professional name is Kazu Yo. Okay. Yeah. So your mom, when she was interned in the uh, camp during the Second World War, how old mm -hmm. was she? Um, she was about nine when they went into camp. Okay. Um, they went to an assembly center. Uh, her parents and her younger sister was about three years old. And um, they went to an assembly center in Tanferan, California, which is near like San Mateo. I don't know if anybody knows this area, but no. <laughs> um, and then they were, um, they were um, sent to Topaz, Utah, mm -hmm. right? Uh, which is kind of a desert area. Yeah. Uh, right. And um, they spent about a year and a half there. And then they were transferred to Tule Lake, California, which is in Northern California. I, I don't know how much of the history you want to talk about there, but, um, I think you know. It's very important to talk about it. Now, I'm Canadian, so we had a similar history in Canada. People not from North America may have never heard of this history. And oh. yeah, if you want to talk to how the Japanese Americans were treated at that time. Oh, um, Canadian Japanese were treated um, I hate to say it, but a lot worse than the American mm -hmm. Japanese were, I believe. Um, okay. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm not a historian, so I don't want to say the wrong things. But I know that they, uh, they suffered a lot more than I think the American Japanese did. In fact, um, a lot of them were deported like mm -hmm. pretty quickly to Japan. And I, I, I have a feeling that maybe. Because of that, um, they were they they were deported um, pretty much. But um, American Japanese were not deported, right? They were um, a year and a half a after being in incarcerated. Um, they put out this loyalty question or loyalty questionnaire that mm -hmm. was um, supposed to be used to find out which of the young men would fight in the war. But they decided to give it to everybody who was like age 17 and older, hmm. where even even the first generation, the older people. And uh, there were two hot button questions on it that said um, something like, um, uh, would you you know, fight for the United States and and uh, would you give up your allegiance to the emperor? That type of thing, which assumed that everybody was from Japan. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right. Um Two thirds of of those incarcerated in the United States were American citizens. Mm -hmm. The other one third were the first generation, and if they gave up their allegiance to the emperor, they would be, um, you know, without a state, without a country. Mm -hmm. Right. So, um, so that was a, of course, a very um, personal, very um, heart wrenching decision to make on on those questions, and it came down to thinking that if you um, said no to those questions that you didn't want to be in the United States anymore and they were going to deport you to Japan. Uh, my grandparents were among those people, mm -hmm. right? They were very, you know, they, actually my grandparents were second generation. So they gave up their citizenship in order to uh, leave the United States. But not everybody who um, signed the questionnaire no-no um, went to Japan and mm -hmm. they were not deported, you know, so a lot of them stayed here 
but of course, a lot of them went to Japan. Now, I can't remember. So we'll talk about your, your beautiful documentary, Hidden Legacies, but I'm not sure if it was in that that I learned this or separate reading that in Hawaii, Japanese Americans were not interned, but they had very strict rules about culture, that mm -hmm. they weren't allowed to practice Japanese culture. Mm -hmm. So in, it was just a different hardship. Um, was that in your film? I can't remember. Oh, that came out. we touched on it. Um, yeah. Because yeah, it was different in Hawaii because there were a lot more Japanese who were, you know, uh, working in, in Hawaii, right. In the mm -hmm. government and the, in, 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 um, companies and such. So they couldn't really take all those people and put them in camps because otherwise mm -hmm. everything would shut down. <laughs> right. I, they did have some camps, um, not as many as, you know, we, we, we did in the United States, but, um, you know, it, because they weren't put in, in a different place in a prison, mm -hmm far away in the deserts and remote areas, they were still among the cities or towns. And if they practiced anything Japanese, sometimes, you know, people would um, shoot into their house or whatever, mm -hmm. right? Because they're, they're still there. So, yeah. so they pretty much had to stop doing what, whatever they were doing as far as Japanese cultural arts. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. The, the flip side of uh, American Japanese being in, in these remote areas was that they could continue to practice traditional arts because nobody else could hear them or see them. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, and the government actually paid the teachers because they realized it was keeping people from uprising. Basically it was keeping them calm because right. they had something to do. Right. Right. That was, right. They were now, looked at as, um, Oh, there was, a, there was a title for them and I can't remember now. Uh, but, um, yeah, and they were actually paid on the same scale as a, a doctor. So $19 a month, <laughs> right? Um, because they were, they were helping to keep people, uh, occupied and doing something so that, you know, uh, they wouldn't be thinking about causing riots or, or, or uh, pandemonium, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but so when you were growing up, your mom didn't talk to you about this time in her life. Um, you know, my mother was a child. So, um, when she went into camp, so she talked about camp, but she only talked about it like camp, right? You know, she goes, I learned in camp. So, you know, I, I didn't know anything about that history. So I just assumed that she was talking about summer camp, you know, <laughs> that's the only camp I knew, <clears throat> excuse me. And, um, right. I didn't hear about what that camp was until later. Right. And in, in the community, everybody talked about camp. Right. They didn't say, you know, I was in this prison camp in Arizona or something like, you know, or, um, or, you know, was it, um, yeah, Arizona, Colorado, Utah, right. You know, all these places where the camps were. So how did it work with the instruments? I, I understand some people were able to bring instruments, but in other cases, it was they were incomplete or they had to be made. How did that work? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, um, smaller instruments like the bamboo flute, shakuhachi, mm -hmm. or um, shamisen, which is kind of looks like a banjo a little bit, you know, those can be taken apart and transported, you know, pretty portably, but not the, the koto is six feet long. So, mm -hmm. you know, uh, when I started learning the history, I, I heard these, you know, phrases like they could only take what they could carry, right? And, you know, since my mom was saying I learned in camp, I thought she brought a koto to camp with her. And I said, how did you do that? I thought you could only take what you could carry unless you stuffed it, you know, it's hollow. Maybe you stuffed it with clothes, right? <laughs> you know, so um, we learned after interviewing uh, some of the musicians that were there that um, uh, like one person had friends who uh, stored their kotos for them and said, you know, wherever you end up, just let us know and we'll bring it to you. Okay. Right. Um, I'm, I'm guessing uh, this one teacher that my mom took lessons from in San Francisco. I mean, she was a teacher and she, you know, when your music is your thing, you'll find a way to bring your instrument you know, with you. Right. So, um, I have a feeling she somehow was able to bring it with her. Mm -hmm. Um, somebody else said that, um, they, this, uh, gentleman made a koto for his wife, right. In camp, you know, it wasn't really wonderful, but you know, it was something she could practice on. Right. Mm -hmm. And, um, um, 
when my mom went to my mom's family went to Tule Lake, um, you know, it became the place because, you know, all the no nos, all the people who said no on the loyalty questionnaire were sent to Tule Lake. And a lot of them thought they were going to be deported, of course. Mm -hmm. So two thirds of them were thinking, oh, I don't know the language. I don't know anything about Japan. So I better start learning. Right. Okay. And um, so um, there's a anthropologist, I think his name was, I know his last name is Oppler, who said that there was a resurgence of Japanese culture at Tule Lake. Mm -hmm. Right. And this is because everybody thought they better know some Japanese things if they were going to be sent to Japan. So mm -hmm. all the language classes were filled up, Japanese language, right? And, um, um, of course, you know, cultural arts. So my mom was able to, um, you know, actually, I think my grandpa got um, uh, one of the kotos for my mother. So, so she's able to practice on something. And um, it had no strings and no bridges. So he got some raffia and tied it, you know, end to end. So it's long enough to stretch over six feet. And then he made uh, little bridges um, out of pieces of wood and toothbrush handles. Right. So she had something to practice on. Yeah. So, you know, people were very, um, very creative. I mean, they made um, finger picks out of cow bones or chicken bones, um, <clears throat> pieces of wood sometimes. Right. Um, Henry Cowell, who I mentioned before, um, was a very good friend of a shakuhachi um, player in Manzanar. And uh, his name was uh, Kitaro Tamada. Mm -hmm. That's, the, his, his letters to Mr. Cowell are the only um, Issei first generation voice that we had in the film. But, um, you know, I don't know if that letter got in. There, there was one letter that asks Mr. Cowell if he can... Um, uh, get some strings for the koto players mm -hmm. and you know um, they were gut strings so I thought wow that's a long piece of gut <laughs> did they really have you know I mean I guess um, are base, base uh, string bases made of that kind of string no right well, they, they used to be. So people mm -hmm. who play like viola da gamba and uh, like original instrument style violins, they, they use gut strings oh. and I yeah, made from sheep gut. So I imagine, you know, intestines are quite long. <laughs> so yes, bass, bass would have been made, yeah. I think, out of, out of gut. What was the process of making that film like for you? Um, it, it was really um, an eye-opening experience to me because... Um, you know, I, I, I just had this little bit of information from my mother. And then when I tried to find more information from other, other people, it was just like not non-existent. And mm -hmm. even when I went to some of the institutions that were, yeah, had grant funding and such, they thought, you know, I just didn't do enough research, but, um, you know, to, that somebody must have done it by now, right? <laughs> kind of thing, because... <laughs> <clears throat> After um, there were reparations, um, I think it was 1988 that um, Ronald Reagan signed um, the reparations for Japanese Americans. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and then it sort of, you know, put a spotlight on that history and wanting to know more about it. That's kind of why I think reparations for African Americans are also something that needs to happen because of what happened, you know, what um, after Japanese Americans received reparations, it received the attention it needed on that mm -hmm. history. And, um, so, um, but it was interesting to me that the, um, the history was being shaped too, right? Because, mm -hmm. um, uh, Japanese Americans, of course, you know, they were, um, you know, upset to find out that even if you were born here, um, they weren't, they didn't receive the same protections as anybody, you know, other people born in the United States, right? And so they wanted to make sure that they were accepted into um, the society, right? When I was reading about the no-no questionnaire mm -hmm. um, in an article, uh -huh. from what I understood, for those people who were born in Japan, who were not born in the United States, that they were not eligible for American citizenship. So if they said, we're not loyal to the emperor of Japan, they were stateless because they could not get American citizenship. That's right. That's Which right. is shocking, yeah. really. Yeah. And devastating. Yeah. 
See, what were, what were we talking about before that? <laughs> the, well, the process of making the film, because you hadn't made a film before that? No. Or had you? I'm not okay. a filmmaker. <laughs> I mean, I guess now I am. But, <laughs> but um, you know, I, I had thought about if I was going to put some something together that people could um, see and understand, it would have to be, to me, um, if, if I could find survivors of the mm-hmm. camp who experienced the arts in you know, when they were there, then they can tell their stories because, you know, of course that's different, right? To hear it from people who experienced it, you know, even though I felt like I was kind of on the, the later edge of capturing those stories, um, you know, it, it had to be gathered by, you know, at, at that time people I went to to try to get funding, to try and explore that a little bit more, didn't think that was important. Right, yeah. because they wanted the um, the the message to, that went out to be that we are Americans, we are you know we have no foot in another country because mm. we are loyal Americans. D- did you get funding from the American Civil Liberties Union for the film? Well, I, I got it from uh, National Park Service. Oh, um, what do they call it? confinement sites grant? I, okay. I tried uh, the California. Um, what is it called? California Library Civil Liberties, um, something like okay. that. Um, they have these sessions that you can go to, to um, so that you can put your grant together in mm-hmm. such a way that you know they they want to see it in a certain mm-hmm. you know voice or whatever. And um, one of them told me, um, "Oh, we don't fund any music, you know, <laughs> like that." <laughs> I was just looking for cultural music at the time, and and then I'd look at the people who were granted funding, and it would be. Um, you know, new works about the camp, like, you know, oh, this is a new composition about camp or, you know, something like mm. this. But, <laughs> but um, you know, they didn't, maybe they didn't want the information to go out mm. there that people did Japanese things and camp, right? I mean, I think that's, that's kind of what it was. That, because that's, you know, that's why you saw a lot of history about, oh, they did swing music and they did, you know, they had orchestras and they had, um, you know, right, uh, anything that was more, uh, you know, Western, mm-hmm. but not, not the Japanese arts, right? So I started to f- you know, think that there was, there was a part of them that were starting to feel ashamed of being, you know, having Japanese heritage. Mm-hmm. Right. And and I know that, you know, immigrant communities that come to whatever country they go to, they start to assimilate into that culture, that main culture. Right. Mm-hmm. But, um, you know, we found that um, Japanese Americans actually assimilated two generations faster than everybody else because of the camp war experience. In terms of your Japanese language, how much did you know when you went to Japan to spend six months there to get your teaching certification? Uh, well, <laughs> um, I didn't know too much. Um, my, my parents are kind of interesting cause they're both, see, one is a uh, second generation uh, Japanese who was educated in Japan. So his, my dad's, um, uh, Japanese was pretty, pretty good. And his English was, um, n- not as good. He had a thick accent. Mm-hmm. My mom is a uh, third generation and, um, uh, born here and, um, spent some time in Japan after the war. Mm-hmm. So we heard Japanese. I heard Japanese growing up. Um, I could understand it better than I could speak it. I went to Japanese mm-hmm. school every s- Saturday. I wanted to speak Japanese. Um, so when I went to college, I majored in Japanese. Um, but uh, I went to UC Berkeley, and mm-hmm. it was like the beginning, the early 70s. So it was right after the civil war, I'm um, civil war, <laughs> civil rights unrest. And, um, you know, the form formulation of ethnic studies programs, you know, it was a um, brand new department at Berkeley and, um, you know, the ethnic studies had conversational Japanese, uh, as one of the classes, they had conversational, um, Cantonese, things like that. Right. But since they were a new department, they didn't um, assign much credit for it. You know, you, you might get one unit. Mm-hmm. So so I majored in Japanese because I wanted to learn Japanese. Um, 
Uh, and uh, the Japanese that was taught at Berkeley was under a department called Oriental Language. Mm -hmm. Right. It was mostly classical Japanese. Right. So okay. um, at that time, I thought, oh, this is terrible because I, you know, classical Japanese is great, but I won't be able to talk to anybody. <laughs> right. You know, and, it, you know, even Japanese people I met from Japan would say, wow, you're learning, you know, poetry, you know, man manyoshu, kokinshu, tales of Genji. We don't even do that in Japan. Right? <laughs> so that made me think even more. I'm not going to be able to speak to anybody. But um, after I graduated, um, yeah, I took my first trip to Japan for my degree. And um, I wanted to speak in Japanese, you know, to try my Japanese. But I didn't realize that the... The Japanese I was hearing when I was growing up was my dad's Japanese. That's a man's Japanese. And okay. it's a little more, you know, of course, it's more masculine. It's more your dad talking to the daughter, which is more kind of looking down. <laughs> There's different mm -hmm. levels of speaking, right? And, um, you know, so I get these really strange looks like, oh, my gosh, who is that? <laughs> she talks like a man. <laughs> So um, when I started to realize my Japanese wasn't kosher, right? <laughs> I, I just, I, be, I was, um, I shut up for the next two or three months, you know, <laughs> I didn't want to offend anybody else. So, yeah. So it took me a while to kind of get into the language, right? And, and I don't speak um, fluently still, but mm -hmm. um, when I um, was taking lessons at the headquarters, of course, they all speak Japanese, and, um, you know, it's pretty much the language of music, right? You don't really mm -hmm. need words, you know. So, Were there elements of, of culture shock living there? Oh, definitely. <laughs> you know, um, since I grew up with all this Japanese around me, my, my dad was a, um, he peddled Japanese food on a panel truck that mm -hmm. he would um, drive to Japanese families' homes and, and sell that, right? So I thought I was totally Japanese, and then I got to Japan and realized how American I was because of the way the culture was, you know, different things were like, um, right. I mean, uh, one of the stories was about, um, this one, uh, police officer that was living with this elderly couple, you know, the elderly couple, um, were friends of my grandparents. Mm -hmm. So when I went to Japan, I also stayed with them. Right. And, um, he told me that his, one of his best friends was uh, having, um, becoming friendly with the police chief's daughter, right? They were dating, actually. And then the, her mother came, came in and said, oh, you, you must stop this relationship right now because, you know, she is of higher status than you, right, kind of thing. And I thought, oh, my gosh. I mean, what, you know, what, a, what more perfect um, couple would it be, you know, to have the police chief's daughter go with a police officer because she would understand the life of a police officer. But then, you know, they, there it's like if you're the different status, you cannot be together, right? Hmm. You know, and I thought, no, that's, that's not right. <laughs> I, as an American, I was thinking, you know, well, that doesn't make sense to me. <laughs> but, now, you mentioned you were at Berkeley. You were playing classical guitar then as well? Oh, I didn't learn uh, classical guitar at Berkeley. Actually, <laughs> I was, um, when I went to Japan, I, I got a letter mm -hmm. saying, you need one more class to graduate, right? So <laughs> I said, oh, gosh, I have to go back. So so I asked um, the uh, my counselor, if I needed to go back to Berkeley to do that one more class. And uh, she said, no, you can go to any four-year college. So I decided to go to Cal State Hayward. Well, they call it Cal State East Bay nowadays because mm -hmm. they had a great music department. And um, and I decided to um, not only take the one more class I, I needed to, you know, make sure that I satisfied all the requirements, but I decided to have fun with it. So I took uh, classical guitar. I took voice. I took... Uh, tennis. Uh, <laughs> right? I said, wow, this is, this is going to be fun. Right? <laughs> so um, that's when I took guitar. It, it kind of turned out to be a, a good thing because I could mm -hmm. get a little more training on other things. Yeah. And you played violin in school when you were a kid. I did um, from about third grade to, to my senior year in high school. Yeah. I, you know, and you know how you get rebellious with your, your parents and I, 
since everything was koto in my family, I said, I'm not playing koto. I'm going to play the violin. <laughs> and, um, yeah, I was in young people's symphony orchestras and, um, you know, I was, uh, I was really, you know, thinking I'm going to be a violinist until I heard other violinists that were like a thousand times better than me. <laughs> but, um, yeah, because I, I thought the koto was easy, mm -hmm. right? Um, I didn't realize it's, it was easy because it was coming easy to me since I grew up with it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. So, um yeah. So for a while I was, you know, looking toward, you know, violin being my instrument of choice. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Would you be prepared to play another piece for us? Uh, oh yeah. I forgot about that, huh? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let me, um, let me retune this here. Uh, let's see. Yeah. Um, so this piece is, um, that I'm going to play is called Tsubasa ni Notte which means on the wings of a bird. Um, you know, my, my son um, is also an, uh, an excellent koto player, I'm happy to say. <laughs> you know, the koto was actually um, played by mostly women. And I kept thinking, you know, I had two sons, so too bad. <laughs> I, I didn't think, you know, my sons would be interested. Uh, you know, although I wanted them to learn some kind of instrument you know, of course, since I'm a musician. So when they got to be, um, you know, about, I don't know, third grade, something like that, I, I took them to a music shop and I said, hey, what do you want to play? And so my older son, Brian, said, I want to play saxophone, right? Now, my, my friend was um, uh, working at this the House of Woodwinds in Berkeley, mm -hmm. And he, he told Brian, he said, don't play the saxophone. Everybody plays the saxophone. You'll never get a job, right? <laughs> but he goes, I want to play the saxophone. So he played the saxophone, and my second son decided to take drums, right? <laughs> but, um, <clears throat> excuse me, I know that um, I knew that Brian was musical. He had a really good ear from, you know, very young. So I, I taught both of them a little bit of koto, but Brian um, is the one that kind of, you know, stuck to it. And mm -hmm. um, so, um, you yeah, know, I, I'm a little, of course, as an American, I'm outside the box, I think, right? And a lot of his koto players who um, practice and, and um, teach in the United States are a little more open-minded about how we share our music because there are very few of us, number one. And number two, we don't think that we should be so uh, regulated to, you know, one school or whatever. So, and this way we can, um, you know, share our music and, you know, we like each other's music from different schools and we don't have to, you know, be so strict about that. So um, my colleague um, who was teaching in San Francisco, her name is Shoko Hikage, was a, of a different Koto school, the uh, Sawai school uh, based in Tokyo. And um, her, um, the headmaster of that school, Tadao Sawai, um, was composing some very interesting rhythmic music, um, modern music. Young people just, you know, loved it. Mm -hmm. And um, and then his wife Kazue was, um, you know, they were like, even though they both played koto, they played different styles of music, which was just incredible it's an incredible couple and she would just uh, um she would just mesmerize people with her improvisation right so and she even invited us to come and perform with her in a concert in san francisco now i thought i thought it was really unusual for a headmaster to say i want you to invite every koto player in your area to come and join us right <laughs> Mm -hmm. kind of thing. And um, I just loved their philosophy and how they were very, um, very open. So, um, so I got to play um, with uh, Kazue Sawai, perform with her and, and um, other people from other schools, actually, too. I brought Brian to this concert, and he was just, you know, overwhelmed by Kazue Sawai. So he started taking lessons from her. She invited him to come to their um, their school in Tokyo. And they had a dormitory, they had a workshop, they had all this stuff. He became a live-in student. It's called a uchideshi. 
which means um, it's not just you learn how to play the, the koto. You have to, you know, help clean the house, help bring the kids to school, you know, do these little chores. Whenever there's a concert, you have to bring all the instruments. <laughs> so he, he got a really interesting training from the Sawai school. And um, um, and to me, we, we were able to learn, you know, we were able to share uh, our different music with each other, right? So um, there was one piece I just absolutely fell in love with Tsubasa ni Note and I looked all over for the music but this is this is a piece that they were um, keeping for their advanced students so it wasn't published for the for everybody else to play mm -hmm. so <clears throat> and Brian loved it so much that he transcribed it from a recording he listened to both Kazue and Tadao's recording and then um, you know figured it out Mm -hmm. So so now I, I believe um, it's been some years since that time, and, and I think it's published now, and people are playing it from other schools. It's just a beautiful piece. And um, <clears throat> so Brian actually taught me this piece. <laughs> you know, so I'm happy to say. So I hope you like this piece. I'm playing um, Tsubasa ni Note, which means On the Wings of a Bird, by Sawai Tadao.
Thank you. Absolutely mesmerizing and uh, really inspiring. Oh. What is the notation like? Ah, How is this notated? Notation. Um, I can show you a book here. This is uh, one of the first books. Let's see it like that. Wow. Okay. okay. Um, the, so that looks... <laughs> for those people who aren't seeing it, it, it's nothing like I've ever seen before. Oh, okay. <laughs> so um, basically, it's, you know, Western music is you're playing notes, but because uh, the koto has to be tuned before you mm -hmm. um, play it, it's really numbers. So each string has a number, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine to 10. And then 11, 12, and 13, because um, in, in general writing, you write 11, like 10 plus one and 10 plus two and 10 plus three, mm -hmm. there's three different symbols for those three strings. Um, it's read mm -hmm. just like Chinese and Japanese, which is basically, you know, open it the opposite way that, that we open a book. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and then you read downward instead of horizontally from right to left. Each, each box, if you can see it, is one beat. Mm -hmm. A double line means a measure, right? So um, it's kind of like that, okay. like, basically, right? So, yeah. So, so you obviously learned Western notation as a violinist. When you write your arrangements, are you writing in the traditional Japanese notation? Uh, for Koto, yeah. I, okay. Right? Sometimes I do write Western um, arrangements because mm -hmm. uh, we play with Western instruments. Um, sometimes if I'm transcribing, I'll, um, I'll buy a, some sheet music so I can take a look at um, what it actually it makes it easier for me to arrange because, you know, I can mm -hmm. read the music and then figure out um, the main thing would be for Koto is to figure out what your tuning is going to be. Right. Okay. And so sometimes since I'm, you know, restricted to 13 strings, um, I look at the, the scale and think, okay, if I need more um, notes, I can get, by, you know, bending notes, mm -hmm. getting um, some more, um, a little more range that way, right? Sometimes if there's a note that keeps popping up that I'm pressing all the time, all the time, I'll tune, tune it to, to that, right? Instead of mm -hmm. having to bend a note to get up to it all the time, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And do you improvise? Oh, yeah. <laughs> right. But, um, you know, it's just like I was mentioning before, um, you know, one of the things I tried to do um, since I was in a jazz band before was um, to try to find tunings that fit whatever piece it was, whatever song it was, and um, and to be able to um, pretty much play whatever I, you know, on that tuning with that tune. I guess what I meant, yeah, I was worried that you played some jazz in ensembles. I was curious as a just as an individual, if you just improvised in different styles or even in a traditional Japanese style, you know, just to make stuff up. And mm -hmm. if you do that as a, a creative practice. Oh, um, a creative practice. I'm not really, I don't really do it as a practice um, uh, per se, but, you know, I do tell my, um, my students to pr um, practice doing improvisation because they, you know, then they'll be more freer about it. They won't be, you know, as um, a lot of people are scared of improvisation, right? I was scared of improvisation <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> because um, just like many classical musicians, when you're book learned, it's hard to kind of go away from the book in a way. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, one nice thing about, you know, koto tunings is that you could pretty much play them in any order and it sounds nice, right? You know, mm -hmm. So it's um, it's a it's a nice instrument to improvise with because, you know, I think um, like if I was playing violin, I'd be thinking, of course, thinking about what scales I'm in, what um, key signatures, and you mm -hmm. know what, what I can flat or sharp or whatever. <laughs> but you, 
can't do that too much with the koto, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, it's good to be aware of what your notes are so that you can do those things and you can do more with it then, right? Because you understand, you know, what works in, with whatever um, key signatures or chord, mm-hmm. chordal things, right? But Now, when Brian went to Japan to study, I understand your mom wasn't too happy about that, which I found interesting. Oh, <laughs> yeah, she wasn't. Um, yeah, remember, I was mentioning about the school system, right? Mm-hmm. And how... Um, they're pretty strict about trying to keep you within their school, right? So when when Brian uh, received his credentials from a different Koto school, um, you know, to me, in my American mind, I'm thinking, third generation, right? <laughs> you know, here's, here's a, a young person who's uh, going to continue playing Koto. And mm-hmm. I, I know a million other, you know, um, um, uh, practitioners of Japanese traditional arts that would love to have their grandchild be continuing what they do, right? But um, my mother, on the other hand, was very upset because uh, he didn't get his teaching credential under the Chikushi Kai uh, the school. So when people, um, I put a little article in Japanese paper and to announce that so that he can maybe start his own studio and get some students. But um, and people gra- congratulated my mother and she just went, he is not third generation because he didn't get it from my Koto school, right? So, so, um, so since Brian felt bad about that, making grandma mad, um, he went and got his degree from the Chikushi school <laughs> as well. <laughs> <laughs> under his grandmother right so so she was happy about that uh the, the weird thing is um you know like here um, if you get a degree and say you know one university and get another degree from another u- university and everybody says oh wow that person's very well rounded because they've had education from different places but that's not um looked upon as a good thing in the japanese traditional world right they want mm-hmm. you in their school, only that. And, um, you know, it, it looks like you're disloyal if you go from one school to the others. Right. <laughs> mm-hmm. right. So, yeah. So those are different cultural things, I think. Right. Well, we, talk, we talked about your cultural shock when you went to Japan to study. What was it like for him? He was only 17. Uh, well, I, I guess... I'm um, not sure if I can speak for him, but um, it, it was it was difficult for him because he spoke less Japanese than I did. <laughs> he actually told me that um, he didn't eat for the first two or three days because he didn't know how to ask for food. <laughs> and when he went into town, um, you know, in Japan, um, the restaurants sometimes have these wax models of their food, right? So... He kind of went to one of the restaurants and said, I want that. <laughs> oh, no. And he was finally able to eat. Right. <laughs> so um, it was it was pretty difficult at first. And it was funny because he um, there was a TV show that did a little um, spot on that school while he was there. They interviewed, of course, the headmaster and another student. And then they went to Brian and said, oh, he's from America. Right. But Brian insisted on trying to speak in Japanese, which was pretty limited. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, I, I admire Brian because he's very brave about that. You know, if I'm not, if I'm feeling shy and stuff, I'm not going to try and do the, the most difficult thing. Right? And um, he, he actually tries to, in any situation, if we're with a, um, someone from Japan, even though our, our Japanese is not as polished and you know, um, he'll still try and speak to them in, in the language and as much as he can and stuff. So, mm-hmm. so. And, and you made an album with him in 2010. Yes. Yeah. yeah. We did one together called, um, Oyakodon. <laughs> That's actually a, a rice dish, um, that has chicken and egg. Mm-hmm. And o- Oya means, um, uh, you know, parent and child, o- Oyako. Okay. Right. So that's why that dish is called, you know, the chicken and the egg, right? is in the rice. Okay. <laughs> I've seen some of your videos together on, on YouTube, which are, are great, but I haven't heard the album. Are you going to maybe put it on Bandcamp or something or where can people listen to it? Wh- which album? Oh, that album? This album. Yeah. Oh, uh, we, we did it so long ago, right? It's over 10 years ago. 
I guess maybe because I'm older now, I feel like um, I'm not, you know, very up on, on the technology these days. So um, I, I'm, and, and Brian is not a person that is actually um, worried about, you know, getting his name out there or trying to, you know, do that type of thing. So, so we're pretty laid back about <laughs> our approach to doing things. I mean, it's, the strange thing is that, um, you know, since there are fewer and fewer Koto teachers, especially in the Bay Area, um, it's almost like we don't have to advertise because <laughs> right? mm-hmm. there aren't that many of us left. So, um, you know, and that's why my my um, goal has been to make sure that there will be other people after me. And um, so mm-hmm. I'm training another, um, you know, at, um, very... Um, bright student right now to go for her teaching to credential next month. So hopefully, um, you know, I'll have another person out there to help um, keep this music going in this area. Right. And online, you're, you're all teaching online a little bit as yes, well? Yes, I'm uh, teaching online. I have a, I have students in uh, Utah and North Carolina. Actually, I have a new student in Bangkok. I can't believe that one um, mm-hmm. because i um, uh, generally speaking, you know, the traditional way of teaching is in person. And, um, mm-hmm. and I, for a long time, I said, I will never teach by um, virtually, right. But mm-hmm. unfortunately, the pandemic kind of forced us to learn new skills. And, uh, and even then, uh, when people approached me about learning, um, I, I still would like to see them learn in person from somebody. So I tried to scout out and see if there's teachers in their area that they could, um, I could introduce them to and they could learn from that person who's close by. But um, yeah, um, it, it was interesting. The student I have from Bangkok is um, was interesting because she kind of understood that tradition, right? She was saying, you know, is it okay for you to teach um, somebody who, you know, I don't know. I, I think her, she had an instrument herself already. She had all the equipment she needed. And um, she said that, you know, if she had learned from some other person on, you know, from another school, something like this, you have to kind of, there, there's the etiquette of going to that teacher and saying, you know, um, I would like to learn from this teacher instead. <laughs> mm-hmm. You know, there has to be some consent to that. Right. Um, these kind of things. Um, you know, she she would she plays the gujang, actually, the Chinese version of mm-hmm. the koto. And so I said, uh, well, you know, what is it that you really want to do? And she want she likes my jazz koto music and she wanted to mm-hmm. be able to do something like that. Right. On the koto. And I said, hey, I think you could do that on the gujang since you already mm-hmm. know how to play the gujang. And I said, you know, so um uh, I tried to encourage her to to maybe I'll give you some pointers and you you do the, what I do except for on the gujang, right? But she said she loves the the sound of the koto and that's why she bought a koto. She was on a homestay thing, right? You know, high school, so she bought a koto while she was there and brought it back with mm-hmm. her to Bangkok, including uh, finger picks and everything. And um, she's been dying to learn the koto. So so there you go, right? <laughs> Wonderful. Well, I just want to thank you for today sharing your your family history, your love of music, and the important history of the the uh, music in the internment camps as well. And I encourage everyone to watch that Hidden Legacies. It'll be linked, of course, in the description. Oh, thanks so much. Yeah. I hope you enjoyed this week's episode. Thanks for following the series on your favorite podcast player and sharing your favorite episodes with your friends, all of which help find new listeners. I have lots more episodes coming in this season three with a fascinating diversity of musicians and their stories and music. Have a great week. Please consider either buying me a virtual coffee as a tip or becoming a monthly supporter starting at $3 Canadian, which is close to $2 US or 2 euros and getting access to unique perks. The link is in the description. 